Hello everybody, this is Pastor Green. We're doing another Bible study, 1 Kings chapter 3. If you'd like me to come speak at your church or if you have any questions, you can email me or you can comment below, g-o-d-s-o-h-m-a-n at gmail.com. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David, until he had made an end of building his own house, and the house of the Lord, and the walls of Jerusalem round about. And only the people sacrificed in high places, because there was no house built to the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statues of David his father. Only he sacrificed, and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. In Gibeon, the Lord bought Solomon and gave him a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto my servant David the father great mercy, according to his walk before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept him for this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne until this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made me a servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go in, go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which they have chosen, the great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. But you have to understand that Solomon was a young, you know, a young person at this time. King David has died, and Solomon took over. And Solomon had the benefit of watching his father do great things, be a great king. The Jewish people say that King David and King Solomon was like the greatest kings they ever had. So he got to watch what his dad did, and he said, you know, I want to be like him. And he said, Lord, you've you've made my father very blessed. You've taught him many things. I want to be like that. He's saying, but you got to understand, I'm, I'm, I'm not very smart when it comes to being a king, and I have all these people I've got to worry about. James 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. James 1 saying, if you, if you don't know something, then ask God about it. Matthew 11 says, Then he began to obey the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because he repented not. Woe unto thee, Chazerin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for the mighty works which were done on you, and has been done on Tyre and Sidon, and they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. This little bunny says, Lord, give me patience, but hurry. This girl says, Lord, give me patience, because if you give me strength, I'm going to need bail money to go with it. You know, sometimes in life, we don't know what to do, and we'd have to ask for patience, because if you give us strength, it might do something wrong. Romans 5 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience and experience hope. 1 Kings 3, Give therefore thy servant an understanding of heart to judge thy people. That I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this such a great people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this thing. You know, Solomon's like, I don't really know what to do. I'm not really, I'm not very versed in this king thing. So give me an understanding of heart so I can judge my people. You know, people are going to come to him and ask him all kind of questions. We saw in the book of Exodus where Moses set up these people to be judges because so many people came to him. Solomon feared the same thing. I'm going to have all these people coming to me asking me questions, and I want to be a good king and answer them. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked these things, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked for the life of thy enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy works. Words. Although I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise unto thee. So Solomon asked for understanding to judge his people. And because he didn't ask for selfish things, God said, well, wow, you know, since you're going to ask for these great things, I'm going to give you more than just that. You didn't ask to live forever. You didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask that I conquer your enemies. You asked for what you could do to help your people, a very selfless thing, a very humble thing to do. I want to be able to help those that I, I'm on top of. I want to help the people that I, 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 I... Basically, instead of being a king and have people serve me, 
I want to be able to know how to properly serve them. God was impressed by this. He says, I have also given thee what thou hast asked, has not asked, both riches and honor, so thou shalt be not any among the kings like you until all these days. So not only did he get understanding, but he also got riches. He's also getting honor. And later you're going to see he gives them technically long life. It says right here in 1 Kings 3, And if thou wilt walk in my ways, and keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen these days. So God's telling Solomon, you ask for this, I'm going to give you this plus more. And if you go ahead and do what you're supposed to do and honor me, then I'm going to give you long days. Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem, and he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings, and it made a feast to all his servants. You know, after God gives you an answer to your prayers, he may test you to see if it took. You ever went to school? The teacher teaches you stuff, and they don't just walk away after that. They give you a test. They give you a test to see if what they taught you really matters. It says here on the side, a teacher taught the information, but if the student really get it, let's see. You go to a wedding class. They teach you how to, how to weld things. You, you learn how to weld them together, but did you do it properly? Let's see how well this took. Multiple choice question in biology. It taught you the information, but did you really understand what you were being taught? Here's another math problem here. Teacher taught the information, but the student really get it. Let's see. See, in school they teach you things, and they don't just move on. They give you a test. And it's tested to see if you really actually understood the knowledge and you can actually use it in practical uses. God does the same thing with Solomon. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as by common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer to you be tempted among thee that you are evil. But I with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. I love this verse here because people kind of misquote it. It says God won't give you more than you could handle. And it's basically what it says. But it also says he's going to give you a way to escape it. You know, sometimes you, you have something that's too hard to handle. you got to pray to God and say, God, I can't do this. Help me with this. And then you can take more. Sometimes you ask for patience. He puts you in a situation where you're going to need patience. Sometimes he says, I need some bravery. He puts you in a situation to make you brave. You want wisdom? He's going to put you in a situation where you have to use wisdom. He's going to give you what you want, but he's going to do it in a way that you're not going to understand. Job 1. I love the book of Job. This is, And thou sat with Satan, whence, and the Lord said unto Satan, whence, whence cometh thou? Basically, where'd you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, and he said, from going up and going to and from from the earth and walking up and down on it. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, there is none like him on earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He's saying, you think that you're the man. But see, I got this guy right here named Job, and Job loves me. He loves me no matter what. So Satan says, okay, let's test him. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Has thou not made a hedge around him, about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? So has thou blessed the work of his hands, and thy substance decrease the land? Satan's telling God, look, Job's only following you because you protected him. You put a hedge around him so people can't attack him. You've, you've given him riches and glory. You've, everything he's ever done, you've basically blessed. Let's go ahead and mess with Job. But he put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that is thine power, only upon thyself put not his hand. So Satan put forth the presence of the Lord. See, what happened was, is Satan said to God, Yeah, Job follows you, but he only does it because you've blessed him. If you go ahead and do bad things to him, he's going to curse your face. And you find out if you read the book of Job, loses all of his belongings. He still praises God. He loses his kids. He still praises God. Satan comes back later and says, Yeah, but you're not really affecting Job physically. 
So they affect Job physically. They gave him boils and, and all these different problems. And, and Job still praises God no matter what. You know, some people say, Lord, give me wisdom to, which, to know which way to go. But see, as soon as you ask God for wisdom, he's going to put you on a spot where you're going to need it. You know, you ask for certain things, but God's going to say, okay, you want you want this thing. Let me test you to see if you really want it. You want to be more patient? Let's put you in a situation where you have to use patience. Do you really need it? You want wisdom? Let's put you in a situation where you're going to need wisdom. God's going to test you to see if you really want that and if you've learned from your mistakes. Back to 1 Kings. There came about two women that were harlots unto the king, and they stood before him. And one woman said, O oh my lord, I and this woman dwelt in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass on the third day after that I was delivered, this woman delivered also. We were together, there was no stranger with us in the house, save the two in the house. And this woman's child died on the night because she overlaid it. And when she arose in the midnight, she took my son from beside me, while thy handmaiden was asleep, and put it in her bosom. And then she put her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. So if you don't really know what's going on, this lady's saying, me and this other lady both have a child. We both were taking care of the kids. There was nobody else in the house except for our handmaidens. Her child died, and she took her dead child and put it in my bosom, and took my alive child and put it in her bosom. And when I awoke in the morning, I found this child was dead, and I couldn't breastfeed him. Then I realized this is not my child. This lady took my child from me. So she's going to the king saying, King, what do you think? The other woman said, No, no, that's not true. But the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And they said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living son is mine. And they spoke before the king. Then the king said, This one saith, This is the son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other says, Nay, thy son is dead, but this son's living. Both these women are saying that the live son is their son. And the king says, Bring me a sword. And so they brought a sword before the king. And the sword said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one child, or one lady, and half to the other. So he's saying, I don't know how to answer this. You both say it's your child. I've got no way of proving it. I will split the child in half and give both of you half the child. Because he wants to see what the women really care about the child. So he says, take the child, split it in two, give one to one woman, one to the other woman. That's what the, that's what the decree was. Then spoke the woman who the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But an other lady said, Let there be neither mine nor theirs, but divide it. So one lady says, I'd rather have my son die, or I, I'm sorry, I'd rather have my son be with somebody else and be alive than be with me and dead. So, because I want my child to live, you go ahead and give the child to her, that way my son will still be alive. And the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it, for she is the mother therefore. And all of Israel heard the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So the woman said, I'd rather my child live and be with her than be dead. And the king saw that this woman really cared about her child and gave her her child. So if God has given you wisdom in some particular area of life, are you using it for him? God gave some people skills in speaking and teaching. Are you speaking and teaching for him? Maybe you've got skills in educating people. Are you educating people? Maybe you have a craft where you're really crafty and you can build things. You can, you can make beautiful pictures or, or you can actually build clothing or maybe you're a good welder. Are you doing these things for God? Are you giving God your talents that he gave to you? What is the greatest need that you see? And what skills has God given you to achieve that greatest need? See, me personally, when I became a Christian, I said nobody's out there teaching people the science of the Bible. What the Bible really says. You go to school and they teach you these, these crazy ideas that make no sense. I don't see anybody out there that's really 
addressing those issues. So I devoted my life to the combating evolution, to teaching people the truth of the Bible, to evangelizing, to do certain things. You know, there's other people that they don't know much about the Bible, but they're really good at cooking, or they're really good at building things, or they're really good at teaching people. So God gave you a gift. The question is, are you using it for him? If you have a certain skill, how could you use that skill for God? If you go to Exodus 28, they're talking about building the tabernacle. And it says, Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, for whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. God's telling Moses, we're going to make some special outfit for Aaron, and then I have actually found certain people that are skilled at making things, and they're going to make these garments. Exodus 31. See, I have called by name Baziel, the son of Ur, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and a knowledge and an all matter of workmanship to devise cutting works to work in gold and silver and brass and cutting of stones and to set them and in covenant cutting of timber to work all manners of workmanship. And this guy built the, the, the water buckets and the, 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 the lampshades and the tables and he God gave this guy skills to do this because God said, I want... For instance, the candlesticks to be all one piece of gold and done in a certain way. And Moses is like, I don't, I mean, I could try, but I'm not, you know. But he found this guy that had skills to do it. God says, I want it done. This guy's going to do it for me. Exodus 35. And all the women that were wise hearted did spin with their hands. And they brought which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred with them wisdom spun goat hair. So there was w women in the city that could make beautiful clothing and, and, and blankets and, and tapestries. And God found them and they helped with the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Baziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the son of tribe of Judah. And filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. And advised curious works to work in gold, silver, and in brass, and the cutting of stone to set them and carving the wood to make any manner of cutting work. And he had put his heart that he may teach both he and Holab, the son of Ashamarth, the son, son of tribe of Dan, to them that filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work for the engraver and the cutting workmen and all the embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and fine linen to the weaver, even one of them to do work, all of those that devised cutting work. So God picked people in this in this area, all these people of Israel, to do certain tasks. Some had tasks for carpentry. Some had tasks for workmanship of building, you know, gold and silver. Some had tasks of making clothing and blankets and curtains. Some was able to go preach. Some was good there for security. He put, took people in this area and gave them specific skills. And these specific skills were used to create the tabernacle. Exodus 36. And brought Bathiel and Olobab and every wise hearted man, and to whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding, to know how all the work, manner of work, and the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bathiel and Ahoab, and every wise hearted man, in whose heart was the Lord had put wisdom, and every one whose heart stirred in him to come to do the work to do it. So all these people came together to build this tabernacle. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys watching. Hope you guys enjoy the video. If you have any friends that might like this, please share it. If you haven't subscribed or liked the video, please do so. I'll see you guys in the next video. Just want to let you know the bottom left, the bottom right hand corner is going to have the, the First Kings Bible study. The top left is going to be Exodus. And the bottom left is going to be a video YouTube that you're going to like. I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you guys have a great day. Goodbye.